Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, I'm going to be covering soft tissue injuries and fractures for the pediatric patient. And guys, I ask you, please excuse my voice. I've been coughing so much, I'm just getting my voice back, but I'm trying my best, so it is what it is. Um, please do not forget to like this video, subscribe to this channel if you haven't done so already, and help support me and this channel, help it grow by sharing this content and also engaging um, with me in the comment section. And you guys can also engage with each other. Maybe you might have a resource that might help somebody else. Go ahead, put in the comment section and let me know what you'd like to see me cover more extensively or something I haven't covered yet, but you'd like to see me cover, I will add to the list. So to, <coughs> excuse me guys, to get started, uh, we're going to start with the soft tissue injuries. Now, let's take a look at what it says. So soft tissue injury, these are injuries to the muscles, ligaments, tendons, and they're common in children. Something I want to show you, different between your sprain and your strain. So if you take a look here, your strain, that's injury to the muscles and the tendons. And you see where it's pointing here to um, the muscular tendon, the tendinous area right here. Okay. That's muscle and tendon injury. Now your sprain, that's injury to the ligament. And we'll talk about that more in a second. Let's go over dislocations. Make this a little bit bigger for you. All right. A common injury in young children is subluxation or partial dislocation of the radial head. And this is also known as pulled elbow or nursemaid's elbow. So make sure you guys know um, the name for it. The child often cries. They appear anxious. They complain of pain in the elbow or wrist area, area and they refuse to use the affected limb. Of course, they refuse to use it. It's dislocated. It's very painful for them. The practitioner manipulates the arm by applying a firm uh, finger pressure to the head of the radius and then supinates and flexes the forearm to return the bone structure to the normal alignment. So basically, all of this is saying the healthcare provider, they put that bone back in um, alignment manually, okay? A click can be heard or felt. Remember, guys, it's the healthcare provider that's doing this, not you, the nurse. A click uh, may be heard or felt and functional use of the arm returns within minutes of that bone going back into alignment. No immobilization is required. This is not an invasive procedure. No anesthetic is usually required, but a mild pain reliever such as acetaminophen, that's your Tylenol, or ibuprofen, that's your Motrin, that can be administered. Let's talk about sprains. Now, I already went over the difference with you guys, and I showed you guys like a visual. But again, sprains, a sprain occur occurs when trauma to the joint is so severe that the ligament, and that's your key, when we're talking about a spring, we're talking about the ligament. The ligament is partially or completely torn or stretched. The injuries to the ligament. Now, when we're talking about a strain, the strain, this is the microscopic tear in the musculotendinous unit. Now, what's affected, the injury is the muscle and the tendon, okay? So therapeutic management, this is important. The first 12 to 24 hours are the most critical period for virtually all soft tissue injuries. <coughs> Excuse me. And we expect to see either the rice or ices uh, method. Your rest, ice, compression, elevation, that's your rice. Your ices is ice, compression, elevation, support. You want to rest the area, guys. It's injured. You want to give it a chance to heal. Ice. Ice causes a vasoconstriction. It decreases the edema and the swelling. Compression, you want to support that area. And of course, elevation. That elevation also helps with decrease, decreasing that edema and the swelling. And the S is for support. You want to support that area. Soft tissue injuries should be iced immediately. Because what happens, guys, as soon as there's an um, injury, 
all of the vitamins, the nutrients, the minerals, the WBCs, all the good stuff is going to flood that area to try to help out. Well, what's it carried in? It's being carried in the blood. So all of that fluid is rushing to the area and can cause um, swelling. Okay. You want to, you want to ice it immediately. This again, it causes vasoconstriction. This is best accomplished with crushed ice wrapped. Look at this in the towel, screw top ice bag or resealable plastic storage bag. Something important you guys need to know, you never put the ice directly on that patient's skin. It's always going to be wrapped around something and then something placed on the skin, never directly. So the bag of ice will be wrapped in the towel and then that placed on the patient's skin. Ice has a rapid cooling effect on the tissues that reduces edema and pain. It's going to decrease that pelling, uh, decrease that swelling, and decrease the pain immediately. I should never be applied for more than 30 minutes at a time. We don't want to cause injury to the tissue itself. A plastic bag of frozen vegetables such as peas serves as a convenient ice pack for soft tissue injuries. It's clean, it's watertight, it's easily molded to the area that's injured. When available, snow placed in plastic bag can serve as an ice pack. Again, you're never going to place it directly on that patient's skin. Elevating the extremity uses gravity to facilitate venous return. It'll decrease edema formation to the damaged area. Now let's get into fractures. When we're talking about fractures, guys, we're talking about breaking, breaking the bone, right? Right. There are different types of fractures. Make sure you guys know the difference between your transverse versus your oblique versus your spiral. I want to bring something to your attention though, because that spiral, that's what tends, you know, they're asking about a type of fracture. Usually um, for testing purposes, you'll be asked about either the spiral or the green stick. So that's what I'm going to point out to you. So the spiral fracture, this is a slanting and circular twisting around the bone shaft. So the break in the bone is kind of like a twist around the bone. And that kind of lets you know, well, this patient that has this type of fracture, we should suspect abuse. Because when we see a spiral type of fracture, it's usually from abuse. It's usually from an adult or a bigger person twisting that child's arm, causing that type of fracture. So make sure you know that. Oh, by the way, guys, if you watch my previous vi video and I told you I thought Roro got me, it was not Roro. I do not have... <laughs> I do not have um, COVID, but I do have influenza A. I got tested yesterday, so it's influenza A, but I'm good. Uh, growth plate, uh, physio injuries. This is important, what you guys need to know. The epiphyseal plate, <coughs> excuse me, the epiphyseal plate, this is where growth in the bone grows, Okay. And with children, that plate is not sealed yet because the child is still growing. So this is very important for you to know. The growth of the bone happens in the middle in the epiphyseal plate. The weakest point of long bones is the cartilage growth plate or the physis. Consequently, this is a, a frequent site of damage of childhood trauma. And so guys, if this area is where is injured, we're going to be concerned about that child, that child growing, because again, that's where the bone grows. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, um, this figure goes over different types of fraction, um, fractures. Again, make sure you are aware of all the fractures, but another one I'm going to bring to your attention that you usually asked about is the green stick fracture. And this is what it looks like. Okay. So often what you'll do, you'll see different types of fractures, or you'll see one type of fractures and they'll give you the different types and you have to take your mouse and point to what type of fracture it is. So this is what the green stick fracture looks like. It's been seen often on NCLEX, HESI, and ATI exams. Make sure you know it. And guys, I don't write this exam. That exam can change at any time. So make sure you know all of them. I'm just pointing you guys to what has been reported to me that students have seen often. But like I said, I don't have access to the test.
clinical manifestations of fractures. Make sure you know this, guys. So the signs of injury. Patient's going to have generalized swelling in the area. Remember, all of those good things, such as the WBCs, the RBCs, the platelets, the nutrients, the minerals, the vitamin, everything is going to rush to that side of injury to try to help out, right? So we're going to see edema. We're going to see swelling in that area. Generalized swelling. Pain, of course the patient's going to have pain. They got broken bone, tenderness. They're not going to want you to touch that area. They're going to try to guard it because it's painful. You may see deformity. You may see that bone sticking out. Diminish functional use of affected limb or digit. They may not be able to move that affected extremity because it's broken. Patient may also demonstrate bruising, severe muscular rigidity. And this is important. I put a star next to it. Crevitus, that's the grating sound that you hear. That's the sound of those bone fragments. You're not supposed to hear that, right? So this is another uh, telltale sign that the patient has a fracture. Look at this nursing alert. A fracture should uh, be strongly suspected in a small child who refuses to walk or crawl. So they were walking or crawling before, all of a sudden they're refusing to. The reason they're refusing to most likely is because of the pain from that fracture. <clears throat> excuse me, emergency treatment. Make sure that you guys know the emergency treatment. You're going to assess the patient for the six Ps. We're gonna, always going to be concerned when it comes to fractures or if the patient has um, traction. We're going to be concerned with compartment syndrome. So you're going to check them for the six Ps. Are the six Ps here or am I going to remember them on top of my head? Oh, here they are. Great. Because I always forget one. Whenever we go over the six Ps, I always forget one. You're going to assess them for pain pulselessness you know when you check that area distal to the injury if we don't have a pulse uh-oh pallor that area should be you know nice and pink that pink comes from the blood flow if they're pale uh-oh paresthesia where they have that prickling or tingling sensation paralysis where they can't move that area pressure where they, they feel um, a tense um, pressure feeling in that area, okay? One thing that's not here that I'm going to add, the poikothermoregulation or poikothermogenesis, that's um, warmth, right? When you touch your skin, it's supposed to be nice and warm. If it's cool, uh-oh, you should be thinking of compartment syndrome. I know this says pressure, but if I were you, I would also add the poikothermo uh, regulation because their skin should be nice and warm. And if it's not, if it's cool or cold, that it leads you to a sign of possible compartment syndrome. So make sure you know your six Ps and again, add the poikothermal regulation and remember that their skin's supposed to be warm. So let's go back up here, guys. So you're gonna assess them for the six Ps that I just went over with you. Move the injured part um, as little as possible. You want to immobilize that area, right? Immobilize the limb. Use a soft splint or rigid splint. I'm not going to go over all of them, guys. You guys can look at this on your own. You're going to re reassess that patient's neurovascular um, status, apply traction. If circulatory compromise is uh, present, you're going to apply that traction. Elevate the injured limb if possible. You want to apply cold to the area to decrease the pain, decrease the swelling, and of course, call emergency medical services to have that patient transported to get medical help as soon as possible. We went over the six Ps. Nursing alert. How important do you think those six Ps are? They mentioned it in text. We saw it in a box, and now they're giving it to us again in a nursing alert. Make sure you know those six Ps. Let me add my poico, poico thermo regulation. Some books call it poico thermo regulation. Some books call it poico thermogenesis. The concept is still the same. You expect their skin to be nice and warm, not cool or cold. Oh. And that's it for this video, guys. I'm going to make a part two. Part two, we're going to start up, talk about the cast, cast care, and all that good stuff. But for this video, it really was just dislocation and fractures. 
please, in the comment section, let me know what you thought about this video. I'm trying my best to make a video for you guys every day, but I have a feeling if I don't post a video tomorrow, I'm taking tomorrow to rest. I'm okay, guys, but you know, everybody needs to rest sometimes, and I definitely need some fluids and rest. So if you don't see a video tomorrow, that's that's why, but as soon as I can, I'll be making the next video for you. Please, again, let me know what you thought about this video in the comment section. Please don't forget to help support this channel by liking, subscribing, and sharing my content. Don't forget, I have audio lessons available on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com, and <coughs> excuse me. On Saturday, October 30th, 2022, 1 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time, I'm going to have a live NCLEX review for you guys. I'm going to be going over priority and delegation. This is going to be a part two, and it will be on my YouTube live. Guys, thank you so much for watching this video, and you guys will catch me on the next video.